it has been a horrific weekend in Israel and also in Palestine. And I know a lot of people have asked me to cover this and I'm very um, honored that you all look to me for information about things that are going on. We have been working hard to find someone who is on the ground in Israel who can help us understand what is happening there. And we were able to reach uh, Shandy Race. Shandy is the Wall Street Journal's Deputy Bureau Chief for the Middle East and North Africa based in Tel Aviv. And according to the AP, as of one hour ago, several Israeli media outlets citing rescue service officials said at least 600 people have been killed in Israel, including 44 soldiers. The Gaza Health Ministry said 313 people, including 20 children, were killed in the territory. Some 2,000 people have been wounded on each side. Obviously, we're seeing horrific images throughout social media covering what has happened here. And we wanted to get make sure we were getting legitimate information from somebody on the ground from Israel. She woke up Saturday morning. She and her three children and her husband are in Tel Aviv. Shane D, Hi. thank you so much. It's Katie. I really thank appreciate you so much you joining much us. Me, thank Katie. you. And it's really important, I think, for us to get credible information to people watching because, as you know, on social media, there are a lot of things that are flying around. And so thank you again for your time. And thanks to everyone who's who watching. Just if uh, you just joined us, I just want to remind people that Shane B is the Wall Street Journal's deputy bureau chief for the Middle East and North Africa, based in Tel Aviv, Israel. Shane B, I know you woke up Saturday morning. You heard a loud boom, but you didn't think of it, think much of it initially. When did it become clear to you that something catastrophic? When my husband had came running out of the room and said, "Are you seeing what's going on in the south?" Um, I had been sitting on the floor playing with my kids. I was letting my husband sleep late and it was Shabbat and it was also a Jewish holiday. And so I was trying not to look at my phone at all um, and quite proud of myself. <laughs> and uh, he ran out and he said, are you seeing what's going on in the South? And I said, no. And he said, there have been hundreds of rockets. And then I sort of understood what the boom was um, especially because I later learned that a rocket had, or some debris had fallen really close to our apartment. Um, and then we proceeded to hear sirens and we grabbed the kids and we ran into the stairwell and all our neighbors were there. We don't have a bomb shelter in our apartment, so we just had to stay in the stairwell. Um, and my kids were really scared. Can you describe, Shandy, can you describe what, what yeah. was happening in that stairwell? And Well, we actually that day went into the stairwell about three or four times. So they're all kind of a mix. Um, but um, and my kids were like still in pajamas and they were really confused about what was going on. And, um, you know, all the neighbors had come in and there were a bunch of dogs running up and down the stairs, like people had their pets and my kids are afraid of dogs. So they were kind of like freaking out by that. And then we started to hear some explosions, um, which was, I think, the Iron Dome, which, you know, is obviously the technology that can explode the missiles that are falling onto. Yeah. It can intercept missiles. It's basically a shield that can intercept missiles. as they Exactly. And it's Israeli incredibly. Airspace. Um, it's, it's, it's incredibly successful, um, but sometimes uh, these rockets do drop, but we can talk a little bit about that later. But yes, we sat in the bomb shelter and our neighbor or in the stairwell and our neighbor across the hall said, you know, oh, we're so used to this. We've done this so many times. Uh, and um, it was our first time doing it. So it was a little scary. And my son who's six, he was really scared, especially from the booms. And he sort of kept asking us what was going on. and. You know, we were sort of trying to explain it in a way that made sense to a six-year-old. Um, and I don't know if we did a good job because he seemed really scared. Um, but we also didn't want to lie to him. Well, let's talk about sort of, can you, a, a little bit more about where the violence is happening, Shandy? Can you give people sort of an sure. understanding geographically about what is happening in different yeah, parts sure. of Israel okay. right now? So I live in Tel Aviv, which is on the coast of the Mediterranean. And it's sort of like in the center of the country, if you think about it that way. The Gaza Strip 
is this little strip of land that's south of where I am. It's probably like an hour and a half drive. Uh, and it's controlled by Hamas, which is um, designated a terror organization by the United States. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, militants from Hamas uh, broke through the border of Gaza into Israeli territory. Uh, we've just heard that there were possibly something like a thousand militants that broke through, um, which is a massive number. And they basically conducted um, a pretty successful military operation uh, where they invaded Israeli bases, they killed scores of soldiers, uh, and then most frighteningly, they went into Israeli villages and towns and just began slaughtering people and kidnapping people, uh, elderly women, children with their mothers. Um, and the images and now the stories and the witnesses that we have spoken to in the last you know, 24 hours plus um, have been really horrific and harrowing. So that is happening in the South. So about an hour to an hour and a half from where I am. Now, at the same time that they were attacking by land, they also launched this barrage of rockets on Israel. Uh, so far, there have been around 3,500 rockets that have been launched. And some of those rockets have uh, fallen where I live in Tel Aviv, um, and as well as in Jerusalem. And those are mostly intercepted by the Iron Dome system that we were just talking about. But as you said, not all of them have been intercepted because we've seen photographs of buildings in Tel yes. Aviv as well that have been hit by, by that is rockets. Correct. It, is that yes. correct? In fact, my colleague, um, the other night, you know, we were like on WhatsApp messaging each other for a story and he said, have to go, something bad just happened. And I was like, what? And uh, after a while, he told me that the siren didn't go off and a rocket fell right next to his building. Um, and several people were injured. Uh, thankfully, I don't think anybody was killed. But, um, you know, you really rely on those sirens to save your life. So um, he, was, he was quite scared about that. I want to get back to these horrific images we've been seeing on social media, you know, families where they're told their sister isn't coming back and pictures of elderly women, as you said, pictures of wounded teenagers being paraded around Gaza. Can you give us some idea of the brutality that has unfolded uh, since it's been morning. utterly shocking, I think, to everybody in Israel and probably to people all over the world to watch the kind of things that you're seeing. I mean, it's just amazing how much of this footage um, has come out, how much has been filmed. And so there is really just so much of it. And it, it appears very much to all be real. I mean, there are, you know, streets um, filled with bodies, um, just dead bodies, people just gunned down in the streets. Um, there are videos of militants hunting for people, just going home to home, uh, village to village. Um, we spoke to people who, uh, you know, they were hiding in their house on the second floor. And so the militants set their house on fire and they stayed inside as long as they could, but then smoke started coming out of the electric sockets and they couldn't breathe anymore. So they had to jump out the window. Um, and the teenage son broke his leg they had to carry him to, to a neighbor. Um, they were luckily able to survive, but they said it was 12 hours before help came. Uh, and, you know, I think they also said that about 30% uh, of the homes in their village were, um, were destroyed by fires. So these militants were very clearly focused on killing as many civilians as humanly possible. Uh, I imagine they didn't even think that they would be this successful. Uh, and I think the worst images that we have seen are the ones of the hostages that have been taken into Gaza. Um, as you noted, young women who appear to have been raped, um, mutilated, um, you know, their bodies being dragged through the streets and spat on and desecrated. Um, it's just horrific. And, you know, just really hard to watch all these images. And then, of course, um, you know, we've had these horrible episodes where we've spoken to people, like we spoke to this one man, his wife and his two young daughters, um, I think they were three and five, um, went down to visit family for the Jewish holiday in one of these um, villages. 
and his wife called him hysterical that um, there were militants in the house and that they had taken her uh, mother's husband. He stopped hearing from her and um, then he tracked her phone to Gaza, Khan Yunus, and we spoke to him. And, um, you know, I had a couple of pictures of different people that I'd seen online. And so we started forwarding them to him. And finally, we found his wife and children being paraded through Gaza. Um, and it was just unbelievable to see his, his little girls kind of like curled up in balls and his wife just looking completely confused and, you know, militants just screaming um, and holding guns at them. So, you know, I mean, it's just, it's been a really hard story to cover, Katie. You know, it's, um, it's a lot of human suffering and it's really sad. And obviously now there's <coughs> human suffering in Gaza as well because Israel is retaliating. Um, and there are a lot of innocent people who are going to be killed and who are going to be suffering um, for a long time. I, I wanted to ask you about one scene where I guess members of Hamas took, uh, they were on parachutes <clears throat> yeah. or air glided into this music festival, which ironically was a festival for peace. There were many young people there. And can you describe, because I've seen some images on social media and I yeah. don't quite understand. Yeah, what I can. Exactly We've actually been there. working on putting together um, a video recreating this. So there were about 3,000 people, um, a lot of Israelis, but people from really all over the world, DJs from all over the world. They had this nature party rave in the desert. It kind of looks to me not quite like Burning Man, but something like along those lines. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, these militants, yeah, they, they, one way that they penetrated the border was they, um, they flew over and, you know, paraglided over. Um, and you kind of have these images of people just being incredibly confused. And so thousands of people just started running, but remember they're in the desert, so there's no place for them to hide. And they also, I read, thought, Shandy, that it was sort of part of the festival or I'm something. Sure you couldn't it was tell impossible. it first. I mean, kind who of would have thought on. that there would be militants flying off paragliders? You know, like the brain, it, it takes time for the brain to comprehend what's happening. I know that in my own life when, like, you know, I'm driving the car and all of a sudden, like, you know, somebody shoots in front of me and I have to stop. It, it, it takes a minute. Um, so it's not so easy to run when you see something like that, especially when you're not expecting it. The people started running. A lot of people ran into their cars and started driving. Those people actually, what I've heard, were all killed um, because the militants just sort of started shooting up the cars and, you know, they just had basically no chance. A lot of people did try to hide and did try to run away. Uh, and it was described to us as a game of hide and seek. Um, you know, where these people were just, um, Hamas um, fighters were just looking for people to kill and to kidnap. Um, and, you know, we've just spoken to parents who uh, have just told us harrowing stories of, you know, sh shared with us the last video that they had of their daughter or their son. Um, you know, and parents, a lot of parents honestly just rushing down themselves, like getting in their car and just driving to try to find their kids. And you have stories of parents who are just like, mm. you know, sifting through dead bodies, literally like from this rave, just like looking through like 30 different dead bodies for their child and not finding them. And so um, it's really, it's really, really been horrific. I know, I know that you have said Israel has never seen anything like this in its 75 year history and that the attack is completely unprecedented. Is that because of the sheer brutality and the targeting and the methods uh, that Hamas yes, is employing? Yes, I, I think it's, it's primarily because Israel has obviously lost thousands of soldiers in all the various wars that it has fought. So the death toll so far doesn't, doesn't reach some of the other wars that Israel has fought. Um, but I think what's different about this is that I don't recall, I mean, not that I've been alive that long, but I, 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 I know something about Israeli history, a time since 1948 when there were this many civilian deaths in such a short period of time. Israel has obviously dealt with terrorism its entire existence. 
Um, you know, you had the first intifada, the second intifada, you've had bus bombings, uh, but in total, you know, you'd be surprised kind of um, proportionally how small that number is, um, but to lose 600 people in one day. And such a massive yeah. orchestrated attack that seemed to require a lot of planning. And I guess that begs the question, uh, Shandy, and by the way, if you're just joining us, I'm here with Shandy Race, who's the Wall Street Journal's Deputy Bureau Chief for the Middle East and North Africa. Shandy is based in Tel Aviv. But it begs the question, they did this without, I don't know this, but how did Israeli intelligence not pick up anything about the planning of this horrific uh, attack? You know, I am in as much shock as probably everybody else in the world. This is a military that supposedly has one of the best intelligence apparatuses in the world. Um, it's really, really quite shocking. So I don't know the answer, but I can give you some context that could potentially help understand why the Israelis missed this. <clears throat> I think that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, Bibi Netanyahu, has had a strategy of sort of maintaining a level of um, what the Israelis have referred to as stable instability in the West Bank. Um, basically, you know, they understand that every few years Hamas gets kind of strong. They have to go in. They have to sort of bomb some some strongholds. Um, they have to kill a few leaders. Um, but they, they don't generally bring in ground forces. They haven't bring, brought in ground forces since 2014. Uh, and so they're not like full scale wars. They're almost like mini wars or like conflicts. Um, and this strategy has sort mm -hmm. of worked well for Israel. I mean, in, in a way, the country continues to flourish economically, um, culturally. I don't know the last time you've been to Tel Aviv, but it's an amazing food scene, cafe culture. Like, it's really a wonderful um, place to live, a cosmopolitan city. And, you know, they've sort of managed to limit the amount of um, destruction uh, the amount of harm on Israeli citizens um, in Gaza. And I think they took their eye off the ball. I think they thought that they really had Gaza sort of nailed. They understood Gaza was going to be these rockets. They had Iron Dome, but the real threat was in the West Bank um, or maybe on the northern border where there's Hezbollah. And, you know, this government also uh, is a very right wing government, very strongly supports the settlement enterprise in the West Bank. There have, there have been a lot of attacks against settlers over the last year. Um, and so the government was really focused on providing security for people in the West Bank. Uh, and they just, you know, just didn't see Gaza as a threat. And I also think they were fooled and actually deceived by Hamas. You often heard the Israeli government within the last year, year and a half, talk about how you know, in some ways, Hamas was more of a partner than the PA because, you know, yes, they were committed to Israel's destruction. And the Palestinian yes. Authority, yeah, the, which the, the official the, uh, government. The Western recognized government is in the West Bank, the Palestinian Authority. And so, um, you know, people sort of thought that you could work with Hamas, you could, um, you could negotiate with them. And, you know, if, we, if, if Israel allowed sort of like more work permits for people to enter from Gaza into Israel, that that would help ease the economic situation there. Um, and they just, you know, massively miscalculated and they were deceived. Um, of course, they should have intelligence that should be able to sort of like gut check what they're thinking. Um, and so there was a ma massive intelligence failure on a scale that maybe. But also, uh, you would think there would be intelligence on the ground that would be able to kind of pick up these clues and this massive change of attitude by Hamas in mounting this campaign against yeah, it, Israel. it was just a massive failure. And I think that once Israel gets a hold of the situation, I mean, they're still, they still have not sealed off their border. So they're still fighting militants at the border, which is also just like mind boggling. But I think once they get this situation under control, there's going to be a long war. How many months it goes on for, I don't know. But at the end of that, there will be a lot of people who will be in trouble. Why do you, for the intelligence what do you mean failures? By that? And what do you? How do you? I mean, how do you 
relate Bibi Netanyahu's government, extremely right-wing government, with this, uh, I don't want to say about face, but I guess shift by uh, Hamas and its strategy yeah. towards Israel? I think Hamas probably didn't change <clears throat> so much as they were deceiving Israel all along. But um, I would say that mm -hmm. there were two things that probably pushed them to act now. One is that there was a perception because of the internal political turmoil inside Israel. So just to back up a step, before any of this happened, Israel was embroiled in this massive um, internal turmoil over this judicial overhaul that Netanyahu's government was trying to pass. And yeah, can you explain sure. briefly what he was trying sure. to do to everyone so, watching? So, I mean, essentially he was trying to weaken the Supreme Court so that the government had more power so that the prime minister and lawmakers could pass whatever laws they want and they wouldn't get struck down by the Supreme Court. Um, and so here in Israel, it's kind of the opposite of the United States. The Supreme Court is like the bastion of the left and the government is more right wing. And so the government kept trying to pass laws that the Supreme Court would say were, um, were unconstitutional. And so basically the right wing government said, we keep getting elected, but we can't pass any laws. So the purpose was to weaken the Supreme Court and just limit their ability to do these kinds of things to overturn laws. And so this is brought hundreds of thousands of Israelis into the streets protesting for more than six months every single Saturday night and many other days of the week. Um, and so what people had been saying was, you know, this is the perfect time for Israel's enemies to strike because the country is so busy with its own drama that it's not focusing on all the uh, external threats That's exactly external threats um you also had an entire movement of um military reservists who were refusing to serve if this legislation passed some of them had stopped showing up and so there were warnings inside the military that this was hurting the israeli military's preparedness which obviously was also a signal to israel's enemies that now might be a good time to strike the second thing that i think pushed hamas um and this is where Iran comes into the equation, is that it seemed that Israel was going to uh, sign a peace deal with Saudi Arabia uh, that was going to be brokered by the Biden administration. Everything that we had been reporting at the Wall Street Journal was that this deal was getting closer and closer. The purpose of this deal to, was basically to create a counterweight to Iran in the region. The United States would back the Saudis. They already back Israel. Israel and the Saudis would have a relationship and you could essentially create create a regional counterweight to Iran. Um, and now of course, uh, Hamas and both Hezbollah are backed by Iran. And so um, there is a lot of people saying that, and I think the reporting will start to come out and, and probably back a lot of this up, that Iran played a role in this and that part of the purpose was to kill this deal, which uh, I think probably will not happen now. What about the significance of the date of the attack uh, with Yom Kippur and some of those other things? Sure. Historically? So the attack happened on October 7th. <clears throat> October 6th, 1973 was 50 years after uh, what Israelis call the Yom Kippur War. Um, and it was a, a very similar not quite similar situation, but it was a surprise attack launched by Syria, Egypt, and other Arab countries against Israel on Yom Kippur, which is the holiest day of the Jewish year. Everybody goes to synagogue. The streets are, there are no cars in the streets. The whole country is praying and fasting. And so uh, the Israelis were caught completely off guard and they suffered um, many, many casualties. And this was uh, a war that has sort of been burned into the Israeli psyche. Uh, something that they sort of swore would never happen again. They would never be unprepared. Uh, and the prime minister at the time, Golda Meir, was for many years blamed um, for not being prepared. Um, and so it's, it's quite shocking to have it almost 50 years to the day um, to have such a similar situation. So Israelis are really in a state of, of shock, um, fear, horror. Um, it's just quite an intense vibe here. I, I can only imagine. And what do you think this does to Netanyahu's power and position in the country, given that this happened under his watch and that some of the domestic turmoil 
that was taking place was directly because of his efforts to weaken the judiciary. Yeah, I think that right now everybody is focused on unity. And I think that he will probably lead the country through this war. And it looks like um, his opponents are willing to join his government, which is something that they absolutely have been refusing to do. Um, that said, uh, as I said earlier, I think that after this war is over or when Israel is in a more stable place, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of consequences for people. And I would imagine that uh, Bibi Netanyahu is going to have a lot of very, very, very tough questions to answer. It's going to be hard to see how he survives this. But I would also say that he has survived a lot in his life um, and he's come back many times. He's Israel's longest serving prime minister. So, you know, I don't want to make any predictions that will make me look foolish, uh, but it's going to be it's going to be hard to come back from this. And as you said, in the short term, there are bigger issues to deal with in, in, in the immediate future in terms of a war that's happening at the border and, you know, just these horrific attacks to process that's being called Israel's September 11th. Do you think that's an Definitely. I mean, parallel? I was in uh, Manhattan on September 11th. And so uh, I remember that feeling. And, you know, it's not quite the same for me. Um, but there is a lot of similar feelings in terms of like waking up the morning after just in total shock and thinking maybe this is a bad dream you know, um, or not being able to sleep at night. Um, there's definitely um, just a sense of disaster on a scale that I think Americans can probably relate to if you think back to 9-11, if you think back to that night when we started to realize, like really realize what had happened um, and when we woke up the next morning. Um, so I definitely think that's an apt comparison. I just want to ask you a couple more questions. Again, thank you so much for doing this. It's super helpful, I think, for everybody watching and for people who follow me on social media. Can you just talk briefly for people about the relationship between Hamas, which has been designated a terrorist group by the EU and the United States, and the Palestinian people? Are they uh, one in the same? Are, sure. you know, can you just give people a sense of how much standing Hamas has among Palestinians, your everyday Palestinians? So, I mean, the West Bank and Gaza are two very different places, um, and it's a little bit hard to um, completely pinpoint how much support Hamas has. Um, obviously, inside Gaza, um, Hamas is an authoritarian government, and they don't allow any dissent at all. So the reality is that it's quite hard to know what average Palestinians feel and who they blame. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, innocent people who didn't who didn't pick to be born in this place. And there's a lot of suffering that's happening there. Um, it's hard to know how much they actually support Hamas or not. In the West Bank, we have a much better sense. Um, I think at most um, the thinking is that support for Hamas is probably around between 30 and 40 percent. Um, of Palestinians. Most Palestinians still support Fatah, which is the political party that controls the Palestinian Authority. Um, the Palestinian Authority is committed to a two-state solution, but there are uh, militant segments within Fatah. So um, there is a wide range of perspectives um, on these types of issues. I would say that what I have been told is that you know, there are obviously um, a lot of Palestinians who um, do not support violence against civilians at all. Um, and then there are some Palestinians who make a distinction between Israeli settlers and Israelis who live inside Israel's internationally recognized borders. Um, uh, and, uh, and then there are obviously, um, you know, people like Hamas that considers all of Israel to be occupied territory. All Israelis are occupiers and therefore none of them can be considered civilians. So there's definitely a range of opinion. <laughs> Right, right. It's it's complicated. Can you talk also about uh, a potential proxy war between Iran and Israel? That's what a lot of people are saying this will ultimately evolve yeah, into that. Yeah, I think that's sort of already started to some extent. I mean, Iran does, um, you know, financially back Hamas. They can't really, you know, do anything um, 
without Iran's backing. Um, I also think that there is a good chance that Hezbollah, which is in southern Lebanon, which is so that's Israel's northern border, um, they've already um, they've already uh, started throwing um, shooting mortars at Israel this morning, um, and so it seems like they're testing the water. They're also backed by Iran, and so you have two Iranian proxies on Israel's south and on Israel's north that are potentially going to get into a battle with Israel, and of course then you have all types of Iranian-backed militants inside the West Bank as well. So uh, Israel could see itself, um, you know, being hit on all sides. And what I worry about uh, is a situation where somehow Israel feels that it has to directly, um, directly confront Iran and, um, you know, you end up having a regional war. I mean, I'm obviously telling you like a worst case scenario in my nightmare situation but i think that there are people who are thinking about that and i i would hope that there are smart people thinking about ways to avoid that but that's kind of like the worst case situation you know it's interesting i get some comments on my social media about uh biden's perceived weakness in this and of course like everything these days in the u.s this has become weaponized uh uh, this attack and and the blame game has started. What are the feelings in Israel about the Biden administration, its reaction, the reaction of Tony Blinken and the State Department and the support Israeli is getting right now from the United I States? I think people are quite happy. Um, I think that the American government has been um, pretty clearly unequivocally supportive, um, willing to send um, weapons and whatever. There have been all sorts of Israeli requests for specific things. And as far as I understand it from the news that's coming out so far, um, Congress and the administration are working hard to send those things. So, uh, you know, from my perspective uh, and from what I've seen online or spoken to people, I have not seen anybody saying that they are upset with the Biden administration's response. Um, you know, now whether, you know, people are saying that Biden is weak and that caused this, I mean, I think there's like enough drama happening here. Um, but, um, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. welcome to American politics in 2023. We've got, a, I've got a total of 59 questions. I know we don't have time to ask, to answer all of them. Let me just mention a few that I've gotten through social media. Someone asked, will Israel negotiate to free the hostages? Do you think the hostages will, I mean, it's so horrifying, but I think about these people who have been taken to Gaza and kid, you know, kidnapped. Do you think that, yeah. that there will be hostages that can be negotiated so, for? So I have to do a little bit more into this, but look a little bit more into this, um, but I worry um, that much will not be able to be done for the hostages. Um, the things that I'm hearing and some of the things that are being said publicly by Israeli officials are that they need to pursue this war as if there are no hostages. It's really frightening and scary to think about that, but the number of hostages is so high. If you just look back at the price that Israel has paid for hostages in the past, so there was a very famous Israeli soldier named Gilad Shalit who was captured by Hamas. I can't remember the year, excuse me, but he was released and I think 1,200 Palestinian prisoners were freed in exchange for this one Israeli soldier. Hamas thinks they're going to get like thousands of prisoners out of Israeli prisons. Israel simply can't do that. Um, Hamas has said that they have broken up the hostages and they're underground in locations all over the Gaza Strip. We've seen pictures on social media yeah. of children I, I don't know cages. if that one is real i saw that one and i it, yeah that one looks i don't know i was either. suspicious of that one but um but there there have been other ones of children being mocked and and it, it, it's 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 very scary i don't know what's going to happen with those hostages i mean it could be that the israeli officials who are sort of saying this that they're not going to do anything for the hostages as part of the negotiating tactics right like you don't want to say we would do anything to get these people back. And Israel does have a history of having special operations where they release, where they save hostages. Actually, Benjamin Netanyahu's brother um, was very famous for the raid in Entebbe when he 
led this raid that saved mm -hmm. um, many hostages. Of course, he was killed in the raid. But um, the point being that Israel does have a history of saving hostages. So maybe they try some sort of operation. But uh, everything I'm seeing so far is just incredibly grim for the future of these people. Um, these, their babies there, women with their babies, and it's just, it's very hard. It is, it is uh, really, I mean, I don't think words describe yeah. how upsetting it is, right? They seem to, to fail us in a situation like this. Um, in terms of, I want to talk about Gaza, though, as well, because Israel has retaliated. And as you mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, there is a lot of human suffering going on in both places. Can, what have you heard about the retaliation by the Israelis? And of course, we're getting numbers that are pretty high about people who have been killed yes, in Gaza so we, as well. we have someone who works for us in Gaza, and we've been in touch with him, and he's been telling me that he's never felt um, sort of tremors uh, across Gaza the way he's feeling them now, that he's never experienced anything like this, just in terms of the way buildings are shaking and the bombing that's been going on. Uh, so there is a lot of innocent life that's going to be lost there. Um, and it's really tragic. It's hard to know in terms of numbers of deaths that are coming out right now, just how many are militants, how many are civilians, but there's no way that, any, that civilians are going to be spared. As someone asked, there seems to be a lot of misinformation floating around. Uh, I, I'm at how, who are the credible sources we can trust? It's a really good question. I would say the Wall Street Journal, uh, obviously. Um, you know, I still believe in the media. Um, I think the New York Times um, does really good work. Um, I think the Washington Post does excellent work. I think Bloomberg does great work. Um, you know, a lot of the news networks. Um, I, I still, you know, maybe I'm old school, but I still believe in those. And I think that we should be very suspicious of videos that we see on Twitter floating around. It's really hard to know what's been verified. And when you go to a news organization like ours, you're going to a place where people think a lot about whether things are verified. Just to give you an example, you know, we saw videos coming out right away of what was happening. And we took a long time before we started reporting those videos because we wanted to make sure that they were authentic. Um, and so, you know, on the one hand, Twitter is a great source of information and um, Telegram and these channels, and they, they help us do our jobs in a lot of ways. But um, I think it's also still really important to try to rely on professionals, although, of course, we do make mistakes. Oh, someone said, why are you using the term militants and not terrorists? When you describe Hamas, do you use the word terrorists? Oh, gosh, this is a tough one to answer. Um, most news organizations don't use the, use the word terrorist for Hamas, and it's a very fair question, but I, I think that um, there is obviously an element uh, of Hamas that is, um, you know, uh, involved in terrorism, but it's much bigger. It's also a political organization. Um, there is a political wing um, to Hamas, and uh, I think that we're trying to sort of walk that fine line between um, distinguishing between the, you know, the, the terrorism part and um, everything else that it does. But Hamas, you know, I looked it up last night because I was getting this question as well. And Hamas has been designated a terrorist organization because of their desire for the complete and utter destruction of Israel by both the United States government and the European Union. So I guess it, I guess therein lies the yeah. rub, right? We always do just we always say that in our stories, um, and I think I said it at the very beginning. Also, um, when I first mentioned Hamas, I mm -hmm. said they are a um, designated terrorist organization, um, and so I give that context always. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. you know the the standard practice generally in the news media is to say militants and, you know, maybe there should be more discussions about that. We, you mentioned the accord that is being backed or brokered by the Biden administration between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Do you think that will not move forward as a result of this or where do you, where does that stand? And aren't those called something uh, oh, the, there's the Abraham Accords. 
Right. There's, Accord. there's the Abraham Accords yes. that was signed under Trump uh, with Netanyahu and the United Arab Emirates, the UAE and Bahrain um, and a few other countries. Um, that that is that that stands. I mean, that that will stay, I think, uh, although you never know. Um, I don't see or I would say there's going to be many challenges to having a deal with Saudi Arabia completed now. I think that the violence that is about to unfold in Gaza, there will be images, there will be lost lives that's going to make it very hard for the Saudis to normalize relations with Israel. And at the same time, you know, part of this Saudi deal had been to grant some major concessions to the Palestinians or significant concessions, um, including steps towards a two-state solution. And I think certainly from what I'm seeing right now, and again, this is, people are very emotional because it's all still ongoing, but, you know, Israelis are saying this is the death of the two-state solution. Like, you know, I mean, it was probably dead before, but it's going to be very, very, very hard at this point for Israel to make any concessions to the Palestinians, even in the West Bank. But who knows? Who knows? I hate to end things on that sort of um, <laughs> depressing note, because I know most people in Israel want a two-state solution. Isn't that accurate? Or at least did? Or is that I'm not trying accurate? To remember the data. I mean, they definitely did at one point. Um, I think this two-state solution has lost a lot of popularity in recent years. Um, on both sides um and there's i mean we could talk for hours about that but you know what happened today is perhaps the final nail in the coffin but there have been lots of nails um in the coffin over the last 20 years or really 30 years since um israel and the palestinians attempted to sign a peace agreement called the oslo accords and it's basically been just um it's, it's only really gone gotten worse since then in a lot of ways and um this is this is almost like you know a capstone to just how horrible things have have gotten here and how much things have devolved shandy race i can't thank you enough honestly this has been super helpful um it's a tragic situation it's a horrific situation and uh i hope you stay safe thank you for covering this for us and um Again, thank you for having this conversation with us. Uh, it's it 944. must be what time for you? They oh, are. and I'm sure, I hope your kids They're are all asleep. asleep. My and, that you have, <laughs> and that you haven't. Oh, okay. Well, listen, it's been obviously a very traumatizing weekend for everybody and um, stay safe. And again, I'd love to continue this conversation Absolutely. as to, you know, news develops and events warrant uh, a continuation but i really thank am you so much katie it was a pleasure and yes absolutely i'm always here and happy to talk